Part 1. First you have 30 seconds to look at questions. Hello, the Museum of London Life. How can I help? Oh, hi. I was wondering if you could send me some information. I've been looking on your website and can't seem to find what I need to know. Certainly, sir. Can I take your name, first of all? Yes, it's James Graham. Ah, uh, OK. So that's G-R-A-H-A-M, correct? No, it's G-R-A-E-M-E. -E. OK, great. Got there in the end. So, how can I help? Well, it says that I can print off some vouchers for reduced entry, but I haven't got a printer. Could you send me some through the post? Sure. What's your address? 16 Mount Hill Road. That's M-O-U-N-T Hill Road, London, E15 2TP. OK. Can I take a contact number for you for our records? Yes, it's double seven o three six four. Sorry, I mean double seven o four six four. Okay, great. I'll get some vouchers sent out to you. Thanks. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions. Could you just clarify what the discount structure is? Of course. So, for groups of four or more, there's a 10% discount applied. If you manage to get together a larger gang of people, 10 or more to be precise, then that figure goes up to 15%. Oh, and what about students like me? Anything extra? Yes. All students get that same 15% discount automatically. But in groups of four or more, that goes up by another 5% to 20%. Would you be coming with friends? No, I think the likelihood is that I'll be on my own. So, how much exactly would that cost me for entry? That's 425 So, with the discount, that makes uh, £3.61, doesn't it? No, sorry. That price was with the discount already applied. Oh, uh, OK. And are there any special exhibitions at the moment? I'll book tickets for that as well today, provided there's something special that I'm particularly interested in. There is, actually. You've just missed a really popular one that took in the Viking period. And coming up, we've got the period known as the Industrial Revolution. But the one we're currently running is called Underground London, which looks at the tunnels, sewers and catacombs beneath the streets of the city. Great. Ideally, I'd like to visit on my birthday, the 13th of July. Let me check. No, that's a Monday. We're closed on Mondays. Ah, oh, that's a shame. Never mind, I'll come the day before. Can I book over the phone now? Certainly. So that's one student ticket for the 12th. Let me take your payment details. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear an extract from a talk about the congestion charging scheme. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. For practical details, I'll pass you over to John Ward from the London Tourist Agency. Thanks. So, that was a brief introduction to the congestion charging scheme. But if you're actually going to be driving your car in London on weekdays, there are a few more details you will need to know. Firstly, you don't need to worry about paying all the time. The charge applies between 7 in the morning and half past 6 in the evening, Monday to Friday. You'll be pleased to hear, however, that because the scheme is intended to reduce traffic during busy working hours, evenings and weekends are free. If you enter the zone during the charging times, you'll be eligible to pay the standard charge of £8, which you can pay until 10 o'clock on that day. After 10 o'clock, this charge rises to £10. But be warned, if you fail to pay before midnight, you will have to pay an automatic penalty charge. In other words, there's no escape. Let's move on to paying. The charge, as I've said, is £8 a day, and the authorities have set up a number of systems to make it easy for you to pay, or rather to ensure that nobody has a good excuse for not paying. So, using your credit card, you can pay by phone, by text message, or on the internet. The other option is to go to one of the 200 pay points inside the zone, or the 9,500 pay points elsewhere in the country. If you know you're going to be driving in and out of London on a regular basis, you can buy weekly, monthly or annual passes, rather like a railway season ticket. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. OK, on to the area itself. The congestion charging zone is everywhere inside London's inner ring road. For those of you not familiar with London's road system, this includes the City of London, that's the main financial district, and the West End, the commercial and entertainment centre. If you're still not sure, there are very clear signs on all roads which indicate when you are entering the area. These are round and have a white letter C on a red background. The scheme is policed by cameras, which photograph all cars entering the area and send them to a computer, which can recognise all British and European car registration plates. If you pay the £8 charge, you'll find London a little easier to drive round than it was before the charge was introduced. But if it's all too much trouble and you decide to leave your car at home, then you are left with public transport. That's trains, buses, taxis or the underground. Some of the money from the congestion charging scheme is being used to upgrade public transport, so you should see improvements there. And because of reductions in the number of private vehicles on London's roads brought about by congestion charging, buses and taxis are providing a quicker, more efficient service than they did in the past. OK, I've covered the main details that you need to know. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation about plans for a university sports centre. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26.
Before we go on to look at specific sports, let's think for a moment about the non-sports facilities we really need here. Uh, things like better changing rooms and showers. Yes. If this really is going to be a state-of-the-art building, it'll need to have high-tech amenities, but mm. also places for people to chill out after all the exercise they've been doing. Somewhere they can meet up for a drink or whatever afterwards is essential in a place like this. But what else? Mm. How about a sauna? Those who use them say it's the perfect way to relax after you've trained. The trouble is, though, that there's a debate going on about how safe they are. Some say it's risky to be exposed to all that heat before or after strenuous exercise, which of course is exactly when people in sports centres want to use them. There have also been problems with people overusing them to sweat off weight. So, to avoid any possible dangers, I don't think I'd include them on my list. Talking of dangers, I wonder whether we ought to have some sort of facility where minor injuries like cuts and bruises and sprains can be treated. Maybe. It would seem to make sense with all the mishaps that are bound to occur when you have so many people running and jumping about and so on. Ah, hold on though. Isn't the new medical centre going to be built right opposite? Yes, it is. It should be finished by the end of next year. <laughs> then there's no point, is there? Anyone who gets hurt can go over there, where there'll be much better treatment than anything mm. we could offer on site. Yes, I can see that. What we should provide, though, is a facility with full-time physiotherapists, for everybody on the campus, that is. As well as treating people, they could work on prevention of things like muscle tears and strains. Right. And something else the new place ought to have, also as a way of preventing injuries, is somewhere to test just how fit people are before they start lifting weights or running long distances and so on. Yes, I was going to suggest that. When I was at the Newport Centre, they put me on a static bike to check out my cardiovascular system. Ah. Then they worked out how much body fat I had. All of it valuable information telling you exactly what shape you're in. Another thing I've heard some universities do, especially some of the newer ones, is provide rooms and equipment for lectures to take place actually inside their sports centres. How do you feel about that? Well, as it happens, I've got first-hand experience of that too. We used to have some of our sports science lectures right next to the main sports hall, and I think it made what we were hearing about seem much more relevant to the real world. So, in that respect, I definitely think it's a good idea, yes. Mm, I can see that, though my own feeling is that we need to have more concrete reasons. Mm. The problem is that we won't have unlimited space, and somehow I don't think providing more lecture halls is going to be one of our priorities. So, I'd be against that one, I'm afraid. Anything else? Hmm. Well, just that I agree about the need to have a place where people can go for a chat and maybe have a coffee or a bite to eat together. That was something I always thought was one of the strong points of the centre in London. It was a great place to find out about new activities from the people who actually did them. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. So what about the main sports facilities themselves? What do we need? Well, we don't need a rugby pitch because there's already one on the campus. Um, the same is true of table tennis, really. Mm. Most of the halls of residence for students have their own tables, so there's no point in using precious space here for any more. Agreed. Uh, something none of them have, though, is any sort of pool. A lot of students have complained about this, saying they have to take a bus downtown if they want to go for a swim. Yes, that's definitely one for this place. Perhaps a jacuzzi, too. That would be nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> it would. Perhaps next to the squash courts, just down there to the right. They are very popular, by the way. I think we should have a couple more here, don't you? Absolutely. And another sport that's been growing in popularity is volleyball, especially since we did so well at the last Olympics. Uh, 
Don't you mean basketball? <laughs> yes, I do. Sorry. Anyway, the point is that there is a court in the old gym next to the students' union building, but it always seems to be fully booked up, even though it's not very good. And there's nowhere else on campus to play. Okay, let's have one of those too. How much space have we got left, by the way? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You will hear part of a lecture on child language acquisition. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Today, in our series of lectures on human language, we're going to be looking at the way in which children acquire language. The study of how people learn to speak has proved to be one of the most fascinating, important, and complex branches of language study. So let's look at these three features in turn. Firstly, why is it fascinating? This stems from the natural interest people take in the developing abilities of young children. People are fascinated by the way in which children learn, particularly their own children. Secondly, it is important to study how we acquire our first language, because the study of child language can lead us to a greater understanding of language as a whole. The third point is that it's a complex study, and this is because of the enormous difficulties that are encountered by researchers as soon as they attempt to explain language development. Especially in the very young child. In today's lecture, we will cover a number of topics. We will start by talking about research methods. There are a number of ways that researchers have investigated children's language, and these include the use of diaries, recordings, and tests. And we'll be looking at how researchers make use of these various methods. We will then go on to examine the language learning process. Starting with the development of speech in young infants during the first year of life, this is the time associated with the emergence of the skills of speech perception. In other words, an emergence of the child's awareness of his or her own ability to speak. We will continue with our examination of the language learning process. This time, by looking at language learning in the older child, that is, in children under five. As they mature, it's possible to begin analysis in conventional linguistic terms, and so in our analysis we will look at phonological, grammatical, and semantic development in preschool children. In the second part of the talk, I would like to review some educational approaches to the question of how linguistic skills can be developed. In other words, how can we assist the young child to learn language skills at school? Initially, we will look at issues that arise in relation to spoken language. We will then look at reading and review a number of approaches that have been proposed in relation to the teaching of reading. Finally, we will conclude today's talk with an account of current thinking about the most neglected area of all: the child's developing awareness of written language. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute. To check your answers.